Welcome to a Healing Peace Podcast. My name is Kimir Baker. I am an overcomer. I am very passionate about helping others to achieve an abundant life fueled by spiritual principles and emotional balance. In this podcast series, we delve into spiritual self-care. Yes, we will explore exercising our minds and bodies, but more importantly, we will discuss strengthening our inner being, embracing God's love, and being filled by the fullness of God. As you take this journey with us, we want to inspire possessing your authentic selves and happiness. Nice to have you back, you guys. I don't know if you've been listening, but last week we had a wonderful time talking to Bev just in terms of grief and dealing with loss. And she made a comment that actually kind of surprised me in terms of talking about post-traumatic stress and how that is linked to grief and loss. I never thought about it that way, but I had more questions and I asked Bev to come back so that we can continue to figure out how to manage ourselves during this time and feel comfortable. I mean, we'll never be 100% comfortable, but at least feel a little bit more victorious about the things that we're experiencing. So Bev, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here again. Yes. And for those who didn't listen last week, great opportunity to go back and listen. Please, Bev, let people know a little bit of who you are. For okay. Those who, yeah. Okay. Last time I forgot to mention that I'm a licensed professional counselor. Oh, that's important. Right, in the state of Texas. And I'm also a licensed chemical dependence counselor. And I have my certified sexual addiction therapy. I'm a candidate for CSAT. So I help people with sexual addiction and porn addiction and things like that as well. I definitely look at things through a lens of trauma because of what happened to me as a young adult, losing not one but two children back to back, suddenly and unexpectedly, the first one to SIDS and then the second one due to premature birth and then a really rocky ride through the NICU at the time. Charlotte would have been 39 this year and Samuel 38. And of course, I am very interested in helping people with their grief and loss issues Mm -hmm and their depression and their anxiety. I studied, one of my things that I really studied out was post-traumatic stress disorder during my master's because that was me. I'm in recovery for PTSD. So I feel like I get it. And we were talking about shared experiences. And I remember being taught that phrase, misery loves company. Oh, yeah, that's true. Right? Well, it's a lie. I've heard that a lot. Oh, it bummers a lot. It, but it, please it, explain. Yes, it's misery loves miserable company. Oh. I want to hear from people who have walked in my shoes and were successful getting through it rather than just somebody who's there and doesn't know what they're talking about and doesn't know how to be empathetic. And so I think about Job's friends, and I heard one professor say, wow, the best thing they ever did was the first seven days when they just sat with Job and said nothing, Mm -hmm. because they had nothing good to say after that. There was a lot of blaming and shaming. So anyhow, just a thought there. And I think about the Me Too movement, by the way, and why that has been so successful is because women have been willing to share their stories of trauma, especially when it comes to sexual abuse. Mm. And it's given us freedom to talk about it without shame. Sure. Here we are, there's no shame in feeling anxious or depressed or going through grief. Many of us do this. In fact, at some point, we're all going to go through this. Sure. And when we were closing out the last time, I kind of highlighted some of the things that was very helpful for you in your journey about dealing with grief. And and that was, as you brought up already, the conversations, wrestling with God, and thinking through and finding good, and even hearing your little mantra, which was really great. And I want to try to flush out a little bit more is, 
how do we apply these things to that anger, anxiety, and depression? Okay. Okay. So again, I would remind all of us that anger is a secondary emotion to pain, to loss. Well, I appreciate you saying that because I'll be angry all the time. And I'm learning how to work through my anger. But you're right. In order for me to work through my anger, I have to realize what the root cause is and deal with that issue. Yeah. And I think it's bottom line is there's this sense of loss of control more easily recognized as fear. The what if the worst thing possible happens and I feel hopeless and helpless. And at the center of our brain are the seat of emotions and they're designed to protect. I think about the limbic system and fight, flight and freeze. Mm -hmm. So anger is coming from this desire to fight. This isn't fair. Why is this happening to me? I don't like it. One of the reactions is, I'm going to fight back. This isn't right. And who's to blame anyway? And so we get in this fight mode. And if we don't kind of, okay, so anger, emotions, we don't need to judge them. They just are. They're neither good nor bad. They're given to us by God to prompt us to think and actually I believe to turn to him for the answers Mm -hmm. and so rather than just sitting in the anger we need to well where's this coming from what's making me feel angry and trying to find that root of well what are my greatest fears and what do I feel is attacking me that makes me want to fight back Mm -hmm. that's an early warning alert system And it's a good thing. But if we just sit in that and stew in it, then we're not really thinking about what God's heart is about the situation. And that's what we need to get to. So anger, anxiety is that freeze mode. When you think about almost getting in a car accident Mm -hmm. and everything goes tight, tight muscles, shallow breathing, rapid heart rate somebody's car is heading towards mine, for example, and I'm just holding my breath like, no, and then it doesn't happen. And we have this, ah, and it explodes, right? We have the sigh of relief, but we can get stuck in that mode of feeling on edge, like, I'm out of control. This world is out of control. Oh, no, I'm going to get the coronavirus. Oh, no, my family member is going to get it. Oh, no. And it's interesting walking through the grocery store and trying to practice social distancing. And I went this morning and wore a mask because that's what the CD is recommending. Mm -hmm. Get home and take all that. But we can let that put us in a place of paralysis where we don't do anything but think about the worst case scenario. And we're not thinking of the answers to that. The depression is the flight. Oh, okay, I don't want to deal with this. I'm just going to isolate and feel very sad. And I don't have any answers. And it's almost, I kind of want to tie that into the shame response. Sure. When we feel hopeless and helpless, if we're bullied, and this coronavirus is a big bully. Yeah. One of the responses, if it's not fight, is to drop the head. This is the shame response. Drop Mm -hmm. the head, avert the eyes, and try to become invisible. Mm. That's a protective mechanism. That's the shame response. I just can't do anything. And so what do people do to get comfort in some of these situations? Well, you usually do kind of crazy stuff. Well, it could be, okay, I'm going to start drinking. Right. Because I can't handle my anxiety, but having a shot of liquor or two or finding my drug of choice, or engaging in, going back to the old habits where we got our ease and comfort that weren't effective, but in the long run, kind of took our mind off it. Some people are binge watching TV. Right. Hour after hour, or they're surfing the internet, hour after hour, maybe seeking answers, or let me just walk to the refrigerator. I'm not hungry, but what? I'm looking for comfort food. And, right. You know, what's the flavor of the hour? And so a lot of people joke about this, but a lot of people are eating way more than they need. Mm-hmm. Because it's something they can control. Mm-hmm. And 
turning our minds off of by doing things like watching a lot of TV or movies and so forth. And some people are going back to their porn addictions. They're getting wrapped up again in masturbation and connecting with people through online porn sites, just to give you an example of, and why are they doing that? Because it gives them a momentary sense of control, ease and comfort, or even pleasure in a really difficult time. So all of those are normal, but wow, we're not reaching out for the kind of help we really need in this situation. We're going back to the things that we could do in secret and in the dark, especially if you're by yourself. I can eat whatever I want. I can order in a pizza and eat all the slices by myself. Mm -hmm. Who's going to know? And I'm going to just sit around and wear my yoga pants because they're real stretchy. (laughs) And then a couple months later, we're going to be really disgusted with ourselves for some of the stuff that we did because we're letting the big bully put us in a place of not being able to fight back. We're just shutting down emotion is what I would say. So common responses. So can you give us some things that we can do to fight that big bully? Okay. Yeah. So, yes. Yes. One, again, normalize this. You are not alone. You're not the only one that is going through this. We need to reach out. And I think I said this last time for me, and you, Camille, mm-hmm. we're both touchy-feely kind of people. Yeah. So we've been told, no, no, <laughs> you can't touch. But we can see, but even on this call, we're just hearing each other auditorily. Well, I know your face. I can almost imagine you know, <laughs> your facial reactions, but I can't. And I love, I'm doing online therapy with people, and I'm using Zoom or FaceTime or Duo. Yeah when people are willing to do that online. And it's the next best thing. It's better than just being on the phone. Sure. We see each other visually. And it's almost like, well, I can reach my hand and touch the screen and you can put yours up there. And there's a sort of connection. So connecting with people in the best way we possibly can. And I think if you are hunkering down in your home with family or significant others, You've got to connect. We need that touch. We need that communication. We don't want to just mindlessly binge watch TV or do superficial things. Those are great to have fun, but we also need to talk about what is bothering us. Mm -hmm. And some people really would benefit from finding a therapist that can talk to them online if they don't feel like their family is helpful to them. So I think about the importance of learning to practice mindfulness. So I've got a lot of feelings. Again, with mindfulness, I'm not going to judge the feeling as good or bad. They just are. They're trying to get my attention for a reason. And so what I need to do is, first of all, I think take a deep breath. We talked about that in the previous podcast about breathing exercises. Yes. So thank you for bringing it back up. Yeah, we have this vagus nerve that travels from the brain and it wraps itself around our internal organs. It is the thing where if you are watching a creepy movie, it gives you this gut feeling, makes your skin crawl, your stomach might start hurting or your heart starts beating rapidly. It's related to what's coming in, the data that's coming in through my eyes, prompts, a thought process, but before it even gets to my frontal cortex, where I think, my executive functioning part of my brain, it's setting off alerts or warnings, okay? And so the vagus nerve travels down and it's attached to the heart, your stomach, your intestines, and even that diaphragm muscle. So when we take the deep breath, the belly breath, and let that out slowly, It's like we're pushing a button that sends a signal back up to the brain. Okay, that was a sigh of relief. And it begins to generate neurochemicals that are going to help the midbrain or the limbic system where the fight, flight, freeze responses are and help them settle down enough to then help me feel safe and begin to engage my brain. 
my executive functioning, decision making, rational thinking part of my brain. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's interesting. It's not the event in and of itself that causes the discomfort. It's how we think about the event. Sure. That can keep this spiral of anxiety or depression or loss going. So I think other helpful things besides the deep breathing, and you can do the four square, you can think about that. Four counts in to breathe, and then hold for four, exhale for four, hold for four. And maybe the four count isn't quite right for you. It could be a three count, it could be a five count. But as you're doing that, you can even be praying, thank you, God, as you breathe in for the air that we have. Thank you that you are in control. And as we breathe out, I'm letting go of my worries and my concerns. I'm giving them to you. And kind of working through things that way can be helpful. But, oh, I lost my train of thought. I'm very sorry. It's with okay. That. So the two things I got is still being creative and connecting. Yes. And using those around you to do that, to not fall into the trap of self-comforting. Yes. And the second one was breathing. Yes. And yes. And I wanted to add moving. Yes. Okay. So some of the other things, practicing gratitude. Remember mm -hmm. we went back to, I had this mantra, stop, drop, and pray with Thanksgiving. Studies have shown that people who will create a gratitude list, adding five new things a day over a period of 21 days, notice improvement in their depression, their depression lifting because their focus is on Thanksgiving and what they have going for them. And I mean, it can be little things like I remember somebody challenging me, you need to list a thousand things. Oh. Before. And you know what? I sat down and for about two and a half hours, I was just writing stuff like, thanks for my right eye, my left eye, for my hand, my right hand, my left hand, naming out family members and friends that I was very grateful for. And I had in probably two and a half hours, at least 750 things that I'd handwritten. Let me tell you, that was revolutionary. But let me, yeah, let me tell you. Studies confirm what we already know is true through the scriptures, but movement, and I like that you brought this up, a 30-minute walk a day or two 15-minute walks in a day, every day of the week, are every bit as beneficial as taking an antidepressant pill. But that consistency, and again, as you're walking, what are you thinking about? Are you noticing the beautiful outdoor surroundings? But taking it to another level, if you will work out an hour, six to seven days of the week, burning about 350 calories, which really isn't that hard of a workout, yeah. if you're consistently doing that six to seven days of the week, people have noticed a reduction in the feelings of anxiety and depression. Movement mm -hmm. is important. I like to share the six F words. And Go for it. So the beginning is focus and giving ourselves permission to take time to focus on the things that we need for self-care or that we need to help others around us as well. So faith is the first thing. What are you putting in your head? What are you thinking about? What are you looking at that's going to inspire you? What are your truths? because a lot of the stuff we listen to produces anxiety and depression are not truth, they're lies, they're perceptions and faulty thinking, cognitive distortions, if you will. Then there's fellowship, and that is I need connection with people that are gonna help bring me up too, and there are lots of resources out there for that. There's fitness, which we just talked about. There's, oh, I'm blanking on my other Fs, but the last one is fun, making sure that you have time for fun. Oh, food. Food affects mood. If we're eating a lot of sugar. Oh, yeah, that should get you. Yeah, food does affect mood. And so make sure that you're eating fresh fruits and vegetables. And if you're having protein, that it's good and clean protein. There's nothing wrong with cheese. There's nothing wrong with garbanzo beans. It's a lot of this, am I having a steady diet? 
of overprocessed and sugary foods because mm-hmm. sugar also impacts our immune system in a negative way. So I appreciate you saying that. I've been saying that for years. No one believes me, but thank you. You are welcome. So those are sort of the broad picture of what can I focus on. Again, faith, fellowship, fitness, food, oh, family, fun. <laughs> it's really important that we make sure that we're getting these needs met on a daily basis. Well, I definitely appreciate you sharing that. And I feel like that was kind of a great closing to this wonderful interview of something that we can do. And it starts with F's and it takes time to figure it out, but work with it. And then before you know it, you're beginning to feel a little bit more alive, your brain will most likely clear up. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people who've been in a lot of brain fog because of the intense emotions and the fear and anxiety. But doing these things for self-care, I'm confident some of that will start to lift. So Bev, I thank you for all the wonderful things that you shared with us today. It was a great opportunity. I hope to be invited back to share on your podcast again, Kamira, and I appreciate the work that you're doing for women in many, many places with your podcast and with your website and all of that. And I'm grateful for our friendship. Well, thank you. And yes, oh, have you back. You done opened up the Pandora's box. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I think we have. (laughs) So I appreciate that. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Bye. (laughs) 